but let's just start with equanimity and do a little equanimity meditation. Okay, so we'll I'll use a few different techniques to try and get it to resonate and hopefully one of them will stick and work for you and then we can unpack it. So nice straight back, solid posture. Come back to your physical experience for a moment. And just thinking again, I would like more love, less attachment. And in order to have more love and less attachment, I need equanimity. Without equanimity, I might become tight-fisted or miserly or feel a deprivation mentality with my love like I only have a certain amount and then I'll run out. With equanimity, love begets love begets love and it just expands and expands. Without equanimity, my love becomes conditional even with the people I already have an established loving relationship with. So just set a very strong motivation, thinking I need equanimity. And with equanimity, may it lead all the way to enlightenment. And then with that strong motivation, shift your focus once again to the breath, allowing surface distractions to settle. And just stay with the breath without push or pull with your thoughts, without agreeing or disagreeing with your thoughts. Just let your thoughts be thoughts and try to keep your interest, focus, attention very simply and lightly on the breath, riding it in the way a surfer might ride a wave. Having the focus not too tight, not too loose.
And now we'll shift to analysis. And so starting with identifying equanimity in this context, impartial, unbiased goodwill for all sentient beings without attachment, hatred, or indifference, regardless of rapport and labels, having this goodwill. Just see if you can connect with some experience of that. And see if you can deepen that sense of equanimity, first by remembering equality, that yourself and all sentient beings have a similar drive, wanting happiness, not wanting suffering. This is true of my loved ones. This is true of people I find difficult. This is true of strangers true of all species. We all want happiness, contentment, peace. We all want to avoid suffering, pain, discontent. Sometimes we get confused because it looks so different person to person. The choices we make are so different. But try to connect with the deep underlying sameness of the drive. All sentient beings are equal in their view. They have innate self-grasping ignorance. They're just confused about what the self is that superimposes or adds features that aren't there, assumes an inherent existence when that is not at all the case. All of us do this And because we have this innate self-grasping ignorance, we cling and get attached to what seems to help the self and are afraid or angry at what seems to harm the self. And all of our negative choices come from that misunderstanding. connect with the sameness of we all do this.
but we're also the same in terms of potential. We all have the ability to evolve. We have Buddha nature. The nature of our mind is clear and knowing, able to reflect and cognize like a still mountain lake, any stains or debris or ripples on the water, like the surface of our mind, these are all extra, adventitious, removable. And we are all the same in having this nature of the mind that has clarity and the ability to cognize. We are all the same in the stains being additional and removable. And then we connect with equanimity by remembering impermanence, the changeability of people and relationships. Sometimes our lack of equanimity is because we feel like some relationships are permanent, therefore stable, reliable, something to depend on. And in one sense that's true but in a deeper sense, it is not. Even the healthiest, most sustainable, consistent relationship in our life will end, even if only at death. We are changing moment to moment. The people in our relationships are changing moment to moment. What the relationship means, its significance changes moment to moment. Our labels change and the meaning of labels change. What is a friend when we're five years old might be different than what is a friend when we're 50. The criteria we use, the expectations we have, reasonable or unreasonable. Even the same person who you've known for decades the label changes in your mind or the significance of the label changes in your mind. 
Sometimes they feel like a stranger. Sometimes they feel like an enemy. Even if your surface label is always, they are my friend. And this is because our experience of closeness or distance changes and how much we want of each. In all of our relationships, we're continuously regulating distance. I want you more close, more often. I need a little bit more space, a little less frequency. Push and pull. Very rarely does it feel like exactly the perfect balance. And even if we strike that balance, shifts very quickly. A feeling of you are too close, you're too far away. Come back, go away. This is true in all of our relationships. So you're just using logic and your own life experience to prove or disprove this point to yourself. And if it's a point you've already reconciled, feel like you're pulling it to the surface of your mind and reinforcing it as if making it stick so your wisdom isn't lost. And then thinking that how often our warmth and our feeling of connection comes from feeling benefited. There is a way to view friends, enemies, and strangers as all beneficial or otherwise through thought transformation. So all sentient beings are equal in the sense that you can view them as beneficial you can also view them as neutral or harmful. Doesn't matter which category you place them in. So take a friend and think, of course they benefit me. I want them close, I feel warmth. I want to benefit them. But what's the whole story? Sometimes you are mutually beneficial and sometimes you're not. Sometimes with friends, we reinforce and placate and allow and condone behaviors that maybe should be challenged. Sometimes because of our attachment to them or even because of the closeness we're afraid to change the dynamic, even when our wisdom increases, even when we want to behave differently. One or the other of us might keep the other stuck. So you're just touching into the fact that friends of course seem beneficial, but that is not the whole story. Recognizing that releases attachment. So think of examples how that has been true. Friends are beneficial, but not always.
And similarly, enemies are harmful, but not always, even if they have absolutely no intention to help us. Their very problematic behavior can be the very thing that helps us transform, that helps us understand the human condition, that helps us understand our own biases. So much resilience and patience have been developed because of problematic people in our life. Objectively, who's to say who was the most beneficial, the friend or the enemy? The label doesn't actually dictate how much you've been benefited. And neither does their attention. They could intend to help, but actually harm. They could intend to harm and actually help. And it goes without saying that strangers are incredibly beneficial or could be harmful or could be neutral. But all of the things we use every day that we're supported by came from the work of strangers. The very seat that we're seated on, the technology that we're using, the food that we eat, the clothes that we're wearing, being directly benefited by the work of strangers. Just allow that fact that you already know, let it touch your heart. And then the deepest way into equanimity is remembering projection. The conceptions of friend, enemy, stranger come from ourselves, not from the side of others. Otherwise, everyone would like or dislike others identically. People's opinions would all be the same. The conceptions of friend, enemy, and stranger do not exist inherently. Otherwise, they would have a natural label before meeting, or the label couldn't change either. You would meet a person, and together with seeing them for the very first time, you would know this is friend, enemy, or stranger in some sort of concrete and obvious way. And even if we have snap decisions about people, 
we know that things are not so solid as that. If people had a natural label, everyone would see them and think exactly the same things without any variation or nuance. And so just see if you can think of your own projections, your own labeling process, the way that you've decided who and what people are. And notice the way in which it feels very obvious and concrete, as if people were only one thing. This is the way attachment oversimplifies tries to make things easy for ourselves. And so we dedicate with the equanimity verse from the Medicine Buddha Puja, thinking all sentient beings who although self and all appearances are dharmadhatu by nature have not realized it thus. I shall endow with happiness and the causes of happiness. I shall separate from suffering and the causes of suffering I shall make inseparable from happiness without suffering. And I shall set in equanimity the cause of well being, free from attachment, aversion, and partiality. And you can relax your attention. Okay, so that's the kind of straight analytical meditation for equanimity. And you could use any one of those chunks just on its own. The other version that probably you're familiar with is when you visualize a friend, an enemy, and a stranger as like representatives of all sentient beings. And you position them one by one and you examine your responses when you see a friend, when you see an enemy, when you see a stranger. And notice the way that your labels arise in dependence upon your feelings of closeness and distance of being benefited or harmed. And you kind of acknowledge the way in which that's all very self-referent and it's not nearly so permanent as it seems. And uh, these projections are also very conditioned by the past. And so you can also do that form where you're actively visualizing friend, enemy, stranger, and thinking about equanimity. And then once you kind of even out that all are the same in wanting happiness and not wanting suffering, you offer them unbiased goodwill and it can take the form of golden light from your heart radiating out and out and out. So that's kind of the classic. And um, that one's quite useful as well. And I like it a lot, but I thought that since we're all together, we might have um, energy as a unit to really go deeply into the an analytical side of it. 
Did you have any questions about that or any interesting ideas that popped up? All the way through this session has been like this black. I've been so excited to do this because this has been my main thing, my attachment to wanting a relationship. And it's sort of, I feel like I've been taking bits off it and I want to hack it down. <laughs> I want to like pull it out of the room and throw it away because I feel like it's it contaminates so much. Um, I'm, I'm confused because I I feel unless I'm just completely wildly wrong, I feel like I I get equanimity. Like I feel like I have this before I found Buddhism, almost freaky love for everybody. <laughs> like I get, like people can irritate me or bug the shit out of me, but excuse my language, but they, but I sort of see their potential and I, and I love them anyway. Yeah, I have this weird, needy attachment thing going on. And I think I understand intellectually that it's nonsense, yet it's, it's, it's there. I don't suppose that's a question, is it? But it's always like, help me hack it down. <laughs> Which bit is the nonsense, do you think? Which bit specifically? Oh, so many parts of it seem not nonsensical, but I suppose it's the, I, I suppose it's the, I'm trying to be, just be really clear. I think it's the, the neediness for love when there's it's abundant but just in different forms let me ask you this if if you love someone very much do they always feel it no and so if people love you do you always feel it and then the Buddhas love all of us all the time, and we only occasionally feel it if we're feeling very receptive, right? And so the thing is, we are, as you say, we're being flooded with this like abundance, this abundant love all the time, so much affection and care and understanding. And, you know, the Buddhas have clairvoyance such to such a degree that it's actually omniscience. They understand how we got this way, <laughs> you know, in, in specific detail, they understand how we got this way and they have absolute acceptance, compassion and love for us and see our potential for enlightenment so clearly. Mm -hmm. And they're just, you know, we're being love bombed all the time, <laughs> but we don't feel it. And so then we're looking for how to feel it. And the most obvious way seems to be if you could get one person to kind of say, yes, you, I love you, <laughs> you know, and for them to say that regularly and often and to demonstrate mm -hmm. it in behaviors and for you to have a go to love giver, <laughs> you know, here's my love, here's my love giver here, you know, <laughs> and I'll give it right back. I'm a nice person that way, but you know, it's just kind of efficient. I don't know. Um, and I think what we forget is how easy it is to love and be loved when you're in the mood for it, that the specific person, it, it doesn't need to be so specific. Think of how you are when you travel or think of how you are with children or how you are with an animal that you have affection for, just how easy it is to love and be loved when you're in the right mood for it, when your head is on straight. You know, there's times in our lives where we just feel flooded with joy for the human race. And it could be, you know, I was thinking one time before COVID, you know, I was walking in Sydney Central Station and um, Sydney Central Station can get quite busy and um, all the platforms were full and people coming and going and I was not in a hurry. So then of course, easier to connect with my motivation, you know? So I was just kind of in amongst the crowd, kind of like as if they were a school of fish that I was a part of. Mm -hmm. And I just felt such affection for these crazy people, you know, like mm -hmm. the sweet ones and the mean ones and the disruptive ones and the careless ones and the ones that were considerate. And it was just like life's rich pageant. And I could just sort of feel my heart open of, oh, sentient mm -hmm. beings. 
you know, but of course I've been in Sydney Central Station and been like, oh my God, sentient beings. Can they just, you know, it's like, it wasn't the conditions or the people that gave me that experience. It was my receptor sites being open to feeling that affection and to giving that affection. And so then, you know, you go to the train, you sit down, someone sits next to you, it's nice. Someone doesn't sit next to you, it's nice. You know, it's empty, it's full, you know, it's just like you feel connected. So you're not chasing connection. And that's so much about what Buddhism is about is to reveal the fact that there has always been and always will be interconnection, interdependence, that you always are connected. You never have been alone. Even if you don't believe in the Buddhas, you're connected to all sentient beings and all beings, you know, in this world from the sky to the ground, down through the ground, we're all totally interdependent. We see how quickly it could all fall apart if we like lost bees or something, you know? Mm. No bees, no people, just like that, you know? And, and we just realize we're all so much supporting each other, even without the intention to support. You know, it's like, I, I, you know, and so, so it's, it's just kind of creating receptor sites for what is there stops the chase. I, I don't want to take up too much time. I just want to just be very specific because I think I felt that quite abundantly for a long time. And I have children that I love and love abundantly. But my specific situation, if I can just be very brief, is that I split up with my husband who I still live with. And I came out as a gay woman about a year and a half ago, went straight into lockdown. So I sort of came out and couldn't get out, is, is my sort of catchphrase. Um, and so I feel I have this fantasy of finding this woman that feels a little bonkers because I do have an enormous amount of love. Even for my ex-husband, we're best friends and we're doing this very beautiful thing and I have lots of friends and family and I'm abundantly loving and expansive and then I have this mad streak of like wanting this thing and which doesn't feel mad it feels beautiful and gorgeous too but it feels like there's too much attached to it and I'm just aware if I don't face this head on all the brilliant things and my studying with Buddhism is going to unravel that's why I want to just yeah bash it out the way <laughs> yeah that yeah. sounds harsh that sounds really cool but um well it, it's it, it's what happens in a million different ways throughout our life though where we find something about ourselves that we didn't realize and then we want to pursue fulfilling it mm. right this happens in a million different ways we find out something about ourselves and we want to fulfill it and what does fulfillment mean and what was that that we discovered is all very amorphous and ambiguous and and i think that the thing to realize is that it will never end if it's driven by attachment you know you'll fulfill something and then something else will need to be fulfilled you know and then you'll realize oh i'm actually a watercolor painter i need to fulfill my lifelong <laughs> ambition to learn how to watercolor paint i don't know you know and then suddenly like i love I don't know, terriers. I need to really understand about this breed. And now everything in my life is about terriers and short haired ones. And I don't know, you know, like this is sort of like the nature of attachment is to be unfulfilled and to give you the illusion that fulfillment is possible via those access points. So if you can break the spell, then you can find a nice girl and settle down and it'll be lovely, you know? But yeah. it's like, have to break the spell that thinks and then I will be done or then I will be satisfied or then I will be complete or then I will be grounded it's like no if it's coming from attachment it will never be enough so if the spell is broken then you can just pursue whatever with that kind of openness and curiosity that has receptor sites to feel nourished by it without being hungry and thinking this is the only thing that can feed me you're self-feeding mm. you know mm. that, that really resonates thank you so much Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, any, any other kind of thoughts or questions to share Let's before? See. Oh, in the chat, it says, I've, I've learned not to take things so personally. Yeah, for sure. For sure. And then there was a, just a quick question in the chat, which is all sentient beings are Dharma Datu by nature. What is Dharma Datu? That was from the prayer I just read from the Medicine Buddha Puja, which is one of my favorite um, four immeasurables prayers. And Dharma Datu just means empty of inherent existence or empty so it's maybe a good way to finish off the session 
all sentient beings who although self and all appearances are dharmadhatu by nature have not realized it thus. I shall endow with happiness and the causes of happiness. I shall separate from suffering and the causes of suffering. I shall make inseparable from happiness without suffering. And I shall set in equanimity the cause of well being, free from attachment, aversion, and partiality. Okay. Can I ask you one question, Venerable? Sure, sure. Um, do you have a website? Yeah, yeah, it's um, integratingbuddhism.net. So integrating Buddhism, one word, no spaces. Thank net. you so much. You're welcome. And since it's the end, we better do um, uh, a quick dedication. Okay, so all of the merit that we put into this course, may it go towards these aims. All right, happy Valentine's Day, everyone, and uh, see you around. Thank you. Venerable, this is really wonderful. Thank you. Come back. Please, please come back. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Venerable. Thank you. Thank you, Venerable. So much. Amazing. Thank you. Thank you.